Because I'm happy and I sing because Well, good morning. Welcome to Blue Ridge Grace Brethren Church this morning. I'm glad to see everyone here. And for those that are joining online, we'd like to welcome you uh, as well. Uh, We have a a few announcements before we get started, Uh, one of which is choir practice will be this coming Tuesday. Yeah, this coming Tuesday. Uh, At least that's the last I, I heard. So choir practice on Tuesday. Uh, On February 13th, we will be having a VBS teachers meeting. Uh, So if you are looking to volunteer to help to either teach or be in the classroom helping, uh, please make it a point to stick around February 13th after the service. Uh, The starter kit came in this week, uh, so it is getting real. uh, And we are going to start planning this really soon uh, so we can get this uh, off the ground and running. Uh, But the uh, other major announcement uh, that I want to uh, make, and the final one that I have, uh, I have spelled out here, uh, but at the members meeting last week, the board recommended to the members uh, that we open up a search uh, for a man to help lead us in worship. Uh, After a a request to table the matter for prayer and consideration, we postponed a final vote on the decision uh, until Sunday, February 27th. Uh, after the worship service, I'm going to call another members meeting uh, for Sunday, February 27th, uh, where we will discuss and take up a final vote on the matter. Uh, if you have any questions or comments uh, about this part-time position that we would like to open up, uh, please let me know, let uh, anyone on the board know so that we can address them uh, at our meeting uh, before we have that final uh, member vote on the 27th. Uh, but uh, I think, and the board agrees, that this would be a good step forward for us, uh, but just we want to make sure that we are doing so in a God-honoring way uh, that will uh, help expand our ministry uh, here. Uh, So with that, uh, we are going to worship uh, and uh, invite you to stand with us as we sing.
Good morning. This morning I will be reading Genesis chapter 1, verse 24, through chapter 2, verse 3. Verse 24. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that moved along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living creature that moves on the ground. 
Then God said, I give every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath in, of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Let us pray. Father, with your simple words you spoke, and it was so. You alone, Lord, are infinitely powerful and creative. Through your creation, Lord, we see your work of your hands. You alone deserve honor and glory as the author of creation. We see your beauty of your hands every day. Almighty Father, Many in our congregation and family members and friends are not able to attend church today. Some are ill, some are fearful, others are hurting in different ways. You, Lord, are the great healer and the great physician. We pray that you provide your comforting touch to help alleviate these many burdens. Lord, thank you for Pastor Davy. He prepares and works long hours to take care of this congregation. He has a heart for you, and his eyes are always fixed upon you. We pray that you continue to bless him, uplift him, strengthen him, and encourage him as he faithfully delivers your word to us this morning. Lord, we thank you for this new year that we can see and count our blessings. We ask that you give a special blessing to our medical personnel, our essential workers, and our military. We pray that you continue to bless this great country and our elected leadership. Give them the wisdom to make decisions that are pleasing to you. Also, if any in leadership positions don't know you, Lord, we ask that you open their eyes, their ears, and their hearts so that they can turn to you and follow your path. Lord, we thank you for loving us just as we are. Thank you for the way you care for us and will never leave us. Most of all, thank you for your son Jesus and the gift of salvation and eternal life for all those who believe he shed his blood and died on the cross for their sins. We pray all this in his holy name, amen. If you would please stand, take out a hymnal, and turn to 495, Jesus Saves.
All right. Laura and I are the type of parents, this might sound crazy, Laura and I are the type of parents that expect obedience out of our children. I know, right? We don't insist upon obedience for the fun of it uh, or to abuse our authority or to go on a power trip. We do it because, relatively speaking, we know more than they know. It's our God-given responsibility and stewardship to guide and direct our children to act properly as well as to protect them from danger. That's our responsibility as, as parents. And one of the ways this plays out in our home is when we tell them to do something, the only, I mean the only appropriate response that we should hear is, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. And then they obey immediately. Obedience is not up for debate. This is not a group discussion time. You follow the commands. If there, is a, if there are questions of why, uh, we entertain questions of why afterwards. We'll, we'll do our best to address them. Uh, you know, we don't believe that because I said so is a sufficient answer. I heard that quite a bit growing up. Why? Because I said so. Eh, it, doesn't, eh, it just doesn't work in our, in our home. We, you know, if something is truly best for them, uh, then it is beneficial to them to explain why we are looking for a particular course of action or for obedience. If our kids are riding their bikes or playing out in the cul-de-sac and there is a car driving down the road, we'll give a holler for them to, to clear out of the road. It's in their best interest. And now is not the time for us to talk about why it's necessary for them to get out of the road. They just need to, to do it. Afterwards, if it's necessary, we'll explain why, and it's you know, clearly so they aren't struck by a car and injured. They receive the blessing of living another day because of their immediate obedience. Of course, there are hundreds of more examples I could give in the parenting realm, but they would all serve to point to a greater reality of we as believers listening to, obeying, and heeding the commands of God. When we believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, his death on the cross, satisfying God's wrath against our sins, we are given new eternal life. And the word of God lists one of those benefits, one of those many benefits of that new life is that we are adopted as adult children into his family. We are now God's children, provided we believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Nothing can undo or take away that status, just like our four children are ours. There's nothing we can do, there's nothing they can do to sever that biological reality that they are our children. Such is the status of saints when they believe in Jesus. Yet as we know, even with biological family members, just because you're related doesn't mean you always see eye to eye. How we act and respond to one another, how we respect one another, goes a long way in realizing the blessings of those relationships. Now turn with me to Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews 4, we are in, we are in the middle of the second of five so-called warning passages in the book of Hebrews. Uh, five locations scattered throughout the book that give stern warnings to these Jewish believers uh, and the severe consequences that come with failure to act accordingly. Uh, the original audience was comprised of Jewish believers who, uh, for the sake of their lives or for the sake of their livelihood, have decided to stop living for Jesus, instead attempting to blend into the world around them, in particular blending in with their original Jewish roots. These warnings extend to us as believers today as well, uh, as when far too often, for the sake of our livelihoods, for the sake of our earthly reputations or our own pleasures and comforts, seek to blend into the world around us, in particular, blending in with our original, unbelieving roots. Yet in this second of five warning passages, the author of Hebrews strongly advises us not to let that happen. Indeed, we should not only hear the word, but we should be doers of it. And as a result, when we live in light of the truths of God's word, God rewards us with his rest. Would you follow along as I read Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 5? 
The author writes, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works." And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word, may we not grow tired of these passages that speak to the importance of holy living and trusting you in every circumstance. We confess that so often we want your blessing in our lives without having to align our will to yours. May your spirit impress these truths upon our hearts and minds that we wouldn't stop at merely knowing the truth, but that we might find purpose in believing it and living out the truth. Thank you for Jesus, whose death on the cross covers our disobedience, and may we seek to serve him every step of the way. We pray in his name. Amen. When we live in light of God's word, God rewards us with his rest. We are now in the third week of this section of Hebrews in which the author takes up Psalm 95. He pulls it up out of the Psalter and and examines it. He shines a spotlight on it. He examines it thoroughly. And as we have looked at the past two weeks, Psalm 95 is a call to worship uh, for us to worship and bow down to serve God according to that which is due him. And yet at the end of Psalm 95, the second half of Psalm 95, the the psalmist issues a warning, and he points back to an earlier event in the history of Israel, which is when the Israelites came up out of the land of Egypt and failed to worship God. They failed to serve him according to his commands, an account recorded for us in Numbers 13 and 14. And in that account, uh, God had already miraculously delivered Israel out of Egypt. They played no role in their deliverance. They didn't issue the plagues. They weren't speaking to, to Pharaoh. They weren't the ones that caused the Red Sea to part for them and then crash back down around, around, excuse me, around the Egyptian army. Uh, the Israels merely went. Their deliverance was solely of the Lord. And now the Lord is leading them on a journey from Egypt to the promised land of Canaan. They've stopped at Mount Sinai along the way where God handed down the law uh, through Moses. And in Numbers 13 and 14, the Israelites are standing on the precipice of the promised land. And God issues a command to them, go, take this land. This land that I've given to Abraham, go in, conquer it, take it, live in it. And when you're done, you will, have, uh, you will be able to rest and enjoy the fruit of their labor. And the Israelites, frankly, said, no, we're not going to do it. Despite all of God's works on their behalf in the past, as soon as they're faced with difficulty, they defy God's commands and express their desire to return to Egypt, where they were enslaved. That was preferable to them. The author of Hebrews, with all of this context in mind, tells his original audience and us today to not be like that generation in the wilderness. God has already worked on our behalf, delivering us from our sins and his wrath in response to our sins. And now our only reasonable response is to submit to his will for our lives. These first century Jews believed in Jesus for eternal life. But now they wanted to take steps to avoid persecution and discomfort in the life they currently had. Yet how often do we have the same mindset? We thank Jesus for his work on the cross, but then we fall short of living in light of it. He's called us to represent him on the earth in the the midst of our unbelieving neighbors and co-workers and friends And then we brush that calling aside because it's too risky. Or perhaps it simply makes us feel uncomfortable. It comes 
at a cost. The author of Hebrews jumps right in at the start in verse 1, writing, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. In the Greek, this verse, this sentence actually stresses the let us fear aspect, uh, which comes across in the King James and New American Standard quite nicely. They place it at the start of the sentence, uh, just like the original Greek does. Uh, the author uh, isn't burying the lead here. He's saying, we better sit up and take notice of this. We're not on a God-honoring path, and there are, are going to be consequences if we don't take God's truths seriously. He said last week in the passage we looked at last week that the corpses of the Israelites piled up in the wilderness due to their disobedience. And we would do well to take that to heart. We would do well to fear in light of it. For that generation that came up out of Egypt, the rest that was before them was the promised land. God gave them a task to complete, to enter into the land and conquer it, killing everyone in their path, leveling all their cities. And the Israelites, in fear, with an unnecessary sense of self-preservation, said no. They failed to believe God's word. They failed to believe God's promise to Abraham in giving the land to them. They failed to believe God's promise to them that he would go with them and make it happen. It doesn't mean that it wouldn't be difficult. It didn't mean that they wouldn't have to continue uh, God along the way. It would still be hard work. But when the work was completed, they would be able to kick back and relax and enjoy the blessings God had in store for them. Yet in the end... They fell short of it. They missed out on it. And for us today, the blessing of rest that's on the table for us as believers is the same as the original audience of Hebrews, which is ruling and reigning with Jesus when he returns to this earth. Of not merely being present in the messianic kingdom, but actually participating in it and enjoying God's blessings to the full of reigning with Jesus when he returns. That's the context of Hebrews, and sure enough, this future earthly kingdom is equated with God's rest in the Old Testament as well. Turn to Isaiah 11. Isaiah chapter 11. This is not the only place that this future kingdom is equated with God's rest, uh, but it is the one that we have time for this morning. Context is critical when it comes uh, to a proper understanding of the word of God. In Isaiah 11, we have a lengthy passage, in fact, an entire chapter highlighting just how wonderful and unique Jesus' coming reign will be. Animals living in harmony with one another, of children playing with cobras and vipers with no problem, even though now it would be one of those things where we say, get away from that cobra. And we would expect a yes, sir, and immediate obedience. But now in, that, in that age to come, in that kingdom, that command, that warning will not be necessary because... Scripture says, look, kids will play with poisonous snakes, and they'll be just fine. And so Isaiah 11 speaks of this future kingdom, this future time. And we pick Isaiah 11 up in verses 9 through 10, which speak of this incredible time to come. Isaiah writes, They shall not hurt, nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. That is a provision of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 that all will know the Lord in that time. Isaiah continues, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. As we Consider this context of Isaiah 11 and this kingdom to come over which Jesus rules and reigns. And Isaiah 11 says, look, this is a resting place of God. As we turn back to Hebrews 3, we see, well, that's what the author of Hebrews is talking about as well. This kingdom to come where Jesus rules and reigns and it is God's rest. The author of Hebrews isn't using new language here, although he's certainly expounding upon it. There is a great and glorious rest for the people of God 
when Jesus returns to this earth. However, the author of Hebrews makes clear that the only way to enter into that rest, to experience that rest, to reap the benefits and blessings of that rest, is for us to do the hard work of faithful service here and now. The problem is is that we are fearing the wrong thing. We ought to fear missing out on this rest. But in our lives, we fear being ostracized. We fear being outcasts. We fear being thought of as odd or weird or a little on the crazy side. We fear no longer fitting in. We fear losing the respect of our friends and coworkers. Honestly, we fear what self-centered pleasures we might need to give up in order to achieve it. We want the benefits of Jesus' death. But we don't want to be all in when it comes to him because we fear that it will place us outside the mainstream of society. We fear like we might have to give something up that we rather like. The author of Hebrews comes along and tells us what we should really fear. That which we should be more concerned about. And that is being found pleasing to the Lord in obedience to his calling in our lives. We should seek to emphasize the benefits of godliness instead of the pleasures of sin. We should live in light of the truths of God's word, for when we do, God rewards us with his rest. If we put in the work now, we reap the rewards later. Is it fun saving for retirement? Is it enjoyable to get those pay stubs and see what your, you know, what your employer automatically deducts or what you begrudgingly give yourself into you know, a Roth or whatever? Was it enjoyable uh, you know, giving away that money that you could spend in the moment on things that you wanted? Or were you thinking of the future and how nice that blessing would be when you could punch out for that final time, go home and reap the rewards of those decades of sacrifice. That delayed gratification greatly enhances our retired lives. Likewise, our delayed gratification, setting aside all the comforts that could be ours in this world for the sake of pursuing and serving Jesus, where it will be worth it all at that time. The problem is is that we kind of want to spend everything the Lord's given us now. And use it for ourselves instead of reinvesting it in his kingdom for his purposes, no matter the earthly cost, so that we can cash in, if you will, when he returns. This is the good news being taught by the author of Hebrews. Yes, he's phrasing it in terms of a warning, but ultimately what a great message that is being set forth here. Live in light of the truths of God's word And he will reward us in the future with his rest. To know there is an end to the suffering in this world and all the more so when that suffering is for the cause of Christ. In fact, this is such good news that the author of Hebrews considers it as such in verse 2 where he writes, For indeed the gospel, or good news, was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, in those who heard it. Now, if, if you are in the New King James as I am, or the King James, they uh, admittedly bring a little confusion into the mix because they translate the Greek word as the gospel. In our common Christian parlance today, the gospel has a super narrow meaning. You know, we, we think of the gospel, Jesus, the sinless Son of God, dying on the cross, taking our sins uh, upon himself, taking God's wrath in our place that by believing in him that we would have eternal life, that uh, his righteousness would become our righteousness. That's usually what comes to mind when we think of the gospel, and yet that's not at all what the author has in mind. That's nowhere near the context. Thus, the other major modern versions translate it correctly and better as good news. New American Standard, for indeed, we have, good, have had good news preached to us, just as those Israelites also did. You know, while we have reason to fear, the good news here is that we can still enter God's rest. We can still experience his blessings. It's not too late, and we'll look at that more in our passage next week, Lord willing. 
The Israelites in the wilderness had their own good news set before them. Turn to Exodus 23. Exodus chapter 23. The author of Hebrews said that the Israelites had good news preached to them, but they didn't believe it. Well, what is that good news? And how does it help us determine what the author of Hebrews is talking about or solidify uh, the, what we're looking at in Hebrews? Look at Exodus 23. At this point in the narrative, they are at Mount Sinai. They are very early on in their journey to Canaan. And in verse 20 of Exodus 23, we read God's good news to Israel. He says, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared, land of Canaan. Beware of him, the angel, and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. And he continues on for several more verses. What was the good news that the Israelite generation heard? That good news that is the context of Hebrews 3, Psalm 95, Numbers 13 and 14. I am going with you. In fact, I'm going before you. Yeah, you're going to have to swing a sword here and there, maybe blow a few trumpets you know, around Jericho, but I am going with you. We can do this. And what did Israel say in response? No, you're not. We go in there, they're going to kill us all. We don't believe you. What was this good news? Again, here in Exodus 23, the good news is that God is going to go before them to bring them into the place which he has prepared. And after they obey, after the hard work is done, they're going to live in this land flowing with milk and honey, and it's going to be great, and God's going to provide for them, and they're going to have great rest. The problem was, as we turn back to Hebrews 3, or rather Hebrews 4, they didn't believe God's promise to them to be true. The good news didn't profit them, as the author of Hebrews says in chapter 4, because they didn't believe it. Here's the thing. We always live according to what we believe to be true. At Kadesh Barnea, they were faced with a choice to believe God's good news, that he would bring them into the place which he had prepared, or to recall Moses, install a new leader, and hightail it back to Egypt. We act according to what we believe to be true. If the Israelites say, God, we believe you, we don't understand, but we believe you, let's go, circumstances would have been different. But in their minds, what they truly believed, they heard what God said, they knew what God said, but what they believed was, if we go in there, we're going to be slaughtered. Therefore, God, the answer is no. We're not going to do it. For us today, according to the author of Hebrews, the good news being preached to us who believe is that we can experience God's rest when Jesus returns to this earth if we obey. If we live in light of the truths of the word of God, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, that all things work together for good to those who love God, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do we believe that to be true? Is that true in our lives? Or do we think, you know what? I can have a foot in both worlds I can go to church on Sunday and then I can, you know, just do my own thing and blend in with the world Monday through Saturday. James says, you do that, you are at enmity with God. God's not pleased with you. God's not going to bless you because of that. And truly, we could be here all afternoon exploring the depths of the New Testament to this end. Not only must we know these truths, but we must live them out and act upon them. 
And here's the disconnect with the vast majority of men and women sitting in churches across the country today, and I don't make that statement lightly. This is the diagnosis of the majority of men and women sitting in pews in this country. They might know the word, but they don't believe it to be true because it's, they're not living it out in their lives. They'll sit and hear the word of God, but they won't do the word of God. Don't get me wrong, hearing the word is essential. We can't believe it. We can't live it out if we don't first know it. But hearing the word is insufficient when it comes to receiving God's blessing. Coming to church is useless if we don't live out what we learn. When we stand before Jesus at the judgment seat, it will be of little concern that we had perfect church attendance on Sunday if our Mondays through Saturdays don't line up with what was being taught on Sunday. Don't misunderstand. Being here on Sunday is important. But it doesn't mean anything. God's, Jesus isn't going to be like, well, you know, at least he went to church. It's not in Scripture. What he's looking for is faithful obedience to what you learned in church. We must know the word, and then we must believe it's telling us the truth. And when we, when we believe that it's telling us the truth, we will live it out accordingly. We sin because we don't take sin as seriously as the word of God tells us to. If we truly understood and believe God's response against our sin, we would be far more careful to avoid it. We blend in with the world because we don't comprehend just how detestable it is to God. We minimize or deprioritize the things of the Lord because we simply don't trust him. To borrow a phrase from our passage last week, we can't expect to be Jesus' companions in the world to come if we want nothing to do with him in this life. Doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have eternal life. That's a separate issue altogether. But I'm assuming this morning, like the author of Hebrews does, that my audience today is primarily comprised of those who have already believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. That issue is settled. It is done and over with. The vast majority of us here today, I feel comfortable saying, you know, we know that we believe the gospel, we have eternal life. But now the issue is, will we trust him in the day today? As a result, I must urge you to then live accordingly. We must live in light of the truths of God's word, God, and when we do, God rewards us with his rest. And that rest comes when the work is done. Rest is something we earn. Eternal life is not. Jesus' work on the cross is credited to our spiritual accounts by grace through faith and not of works, not on the basis of what we've done, but rest, however, comes when the task set before us is completed. But for the Israelites, doing the work of conquering the land started by believing God's promises concerning the land. For us, reigning with Jesus when he returns starts by believing God's promises concerning the world to come. Look at verses 3 through 5 of Hebrews 3. The author says, For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. When we mix hearing with believing, when we bring together what we know we ought to do with actually doing it, we are doers of the word, not hearers only. And then we enter that rest. That's what was set before Israel. Do the work, reap the blessings. Conquer the land, enter the rest. And as it turns out, the pattern of resting after a job well done predated even the Israelites. Early in our service, I asked our brother Rick to read from Genesis 1 and 2. At the time, you may have thought that was an odd choice, but now we see why I had asked him to do so. Sometimes there's a method to my madness. Not always, sometimes there is. But this idea of rest is embedded in the very created order of things. And it originates with God. 
Again, Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. God's work was done. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Rest, work, work, rest, created, made, rest, work. It's all in there in Genesis 2. God worked, then he rested. He completed the task that he set before himself, then he rested. God set the standard for his creation. Rest can be experienced when the work is done. Israel should have completed the task set before them of conquering the land. Then they could have rested. Yet because they didn't complete the work, they died in the wilderness instead of in the rest of the land. And here's the thing, brothers and sisters. We still have before us this offer of rest. That's still on the table for us. The day came when that promise was cut off for the Israelites in the wilderness. Their time expired. But for us who have believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, that promise still sits before us. And because it still sits there before us, because we can still enter that rest, let us fear lest any of us seem to have come short of it. I don't hide the fact that I love what I do. In fact, I had a hard time controlling it in Sunday school this morning. I, I, I love doing this. I don't stand up here because I love the attention or I love being in front of people. I actually hate being the center of attention. You catch me at a family function, I am off in a corner somewhere, away from everything. I, this is not me standing up here. But I love what I do. I love being able to dive into the Word and, with the help of the Holy Spirit, explain the truths of the Word of God to the best of my ability. And hopefully, overall, I, I do a decent job at it. I spend time preparing my sermons and my studies, ultimately because it's what God has called me to do. To do anything else at this stage in my life would be unfaithful to the stewardship that God has given to me. That in and of itself is its own privilege and blessing. But when it comes time to deliver the fruit of my study, it's not for a paycheck, although I appreciate it. It's not for you to think highly of me. It's that you would know, understand, and live out what it is the Word of God teaches. The Lord won't hold me responsible for the results of my preaching. Results are in His hands. Yet I would be thoroughly remiss if I didn't try to impress upon you the importance of living in light of what you hear week in and week out. The importance of living out uh, what you read on your own throughout the week. This is not an intellectual exercise. It is a gateway to trusting and serving the Lord and living in light of his glorious truths. And because of that, let us fear lest any of us seem to have come short of God's rest. Set aside our apprehensions and uncertainties about what will happen if we decide to live our lives as representatives as the, of the holy and most high God and live according to his word. Take these truths. Search them out for yourselves. Make sure that what I'm teaching lines up with what the Word of God teaches. Believe that what the Word of God says is actually going to take place. That God is who He says He is. That He will do what He says He will do. Again, I, I hope this isn't some merely academic exercise in expanding our Bible knowledge. But that the Spirit is convicting each and every one of us to live in light of what we learn. For when we live in light of the truths of God's word, God rewards us with his rest. The work is not done, saints. It's not done, brothers and sisters. Let us consider our great Savior. Let us be diligent in serving him and ministering to his people until the moment he calls us home and not a second before. Then, and only then, in faithful service will we receive his rest. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that we too often love the passages of your word that give us unassailable assurance more than those passages that call us to holy living. We love and cling to eternal life, and yet we too often want to avoid the trials and difficulties in this life that come with representing you as you've called us to. May you forgive us in the ways that we've been unfaithful. And would your spirit so work in our lives that we would live with a boldness and sense of purpose in pursuing that which you've called us to do. May we be quick to point others to the hope that we have in Jesus and not hide it as a light under a bushel. May we live this week in such a way that brings honor and glory to you above anything else. And we ask for your protection and provision and watch care over us until we gather again. We pray all this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. If you would actually turn in your hymnals to hymn number 288. Hymn 288. And stand as we close this morning's service with I know whom I have believed. I know. in a word of benediction. And now unto him, the worthy and only true God, the rewarder of those who diligently seek him, to him be our endless praise, devotion, and commitment now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please fellowship with one another as you leave.